today we're, we're going to look at DegNorm a little bit uh, and give an overview of that. My name is Josh Stoles, and uh, you can follow me at tw on Twitter at Josh Stoles2. Uh, I found this from the R Stats Club, where we were looking through the new Bioconductor release, and uh, I guess they had published this a while ago, but uh, had only published anything in Python previously. And so now they have an R package out. Um, but to give a little background uh, as to why this is relevant, uh, one of the major confounding variables for RNA-seq data sets, um, and this is everywhere, is, is the issue of degradation, both degradation of the tissues and degradation of the actual mRNA itself. Um, and it's not uniform. This is kind of the key part that makes it really difficult is some RNA transcripts degrade faster than others. And so there's been a lot of data normalization projects. Um, many of you are probably familiar with QSVA and that, that was um, a task taken on by Andrew Jaffe uh, to, to try to normalize for these things. And DegNorm is kind of the newest iteration of of these normalizations. And so I figured we'd take a look at it because we are still looking at QSVA. Um, the goal of DegNorm is to create a gene level normalization for degradation in RNA-seq data. Um, and they specifically mention QSVA in the background to say that QSVA is tissue specific. Uh, which as of the moment is, is somewhat of a real criticism. Um, and DegNorm tries to just generalize um, at a gene level to see what degradation is happening per gene to create a much broader overcast of, of the coefficients of degradation. And so we'll get into that more. Uh, first, they, had, they used a bunch of different data sets so and different metrics to try to feed into into their pipeline in order uh, to test their what would I say yeah their their method. Um, so they use the GBM data set and this one is only sorted by RIN. So they had four, I believe four, six, and ten uh, RIN numbers, and they use that as a proxy for degradation. Um, they have blood cells and they allow these to degrade from zero to 72 minutes and allowed one sample to degrade over the course of two days. So effectively what you're doing when these tissues are degrading is you're creating a degradation matrix, right? You have RNA seq at each degradation time. And then eventually you're gonna put that matrix through your, your pipeline. But then they also use our data set, um, our DLPFC at 0, 15, 30, and 60 minutes. And the last two, so the, they had a fresh frozen data set and a formalin fixed paraffin embedded. And I guess their understanding is the FFPE are usually more degraded. So they're using the method as a degradation marker here. And lastly, uh, there's an AMP case tumor study um, where only like one or two, or I guess probably like a, a handful of genes were actually measured. And so you don't have the full data set or the full matrix. And they're trying to use this as a metric for, for imputing since there's only a handful of genes to impute. Okay, so methods, as opposed to what we do, which is in QSVA, we just take a PCA of all the degradation data and then normalize for that PCA. Um, this, this method uses a non-negative matrix and factorizes it, trying to factor out the degradation. Um, there's a lot of much heavier math going on there then I, I can understand. But essentially what it's doing is it's gonna create a, a confidence barrier 
at each gene for degradation and where it falls in between. Um, so actually, I thought their their vignette was was a lot clearer as to what's going on in the paper. Um, so this is from the R package, and this is their pipeline. So you start out with your BAM files and, and your annotation files here, and it will map the reads for you. And you get to a coverage that looks like this. And you can see here, you can somewhat speculate that maybe these samples here were degraded at this position, or maybe here even, right? Um, and then when DEGNORM controls for their matrix, you get a normalized output here. Um, and then it, it can output what is called a what degradation index number, which I'll talk about more later. But you get that by gene. So in figure one here, um, they mapped the data shown earlier and looked at it at certain regions. And here we're assuming that red is more protected data and blue are the more degraded samples. And what you can see here is specifically in D and E are in this region between zero and probably like 2,900 the blue is massively lower. And this is across one gene. And so this is likely a case of, of transcript degradation is what they came to the conclusion of. The other case here that they tried to make is here from 2000 to 2900 and E is degraded, degraded. But I'm a little, I was a little concerned and I made a note that this is all one one exon, right? So this could be a difference of splicing as well. And they did note in their conclusions that one of the drawbacks to this algorithm is it assumes, or how do they phrase it? Essentially degradation in their algorithm is defined broad enough that it includes splicing. So this, whether it's by splicing or degradation is gonna be normalized out. And maybe that's not something you want, especially if you're investigating exons, maybe that becomes an issue. Um, so in figure two here, so this is based off their models, what they expect as a curve for the gene expression at a certain gene um, and B, oh, I have my notes somewhere. B is adding in, I think, certain confounding variables. And now this becomes the real data. And so you can see here that S3 and S4 are actually degraded samples that were left out to be degraded and that they're actually much lower, or no, excuse me, S1 and S2 are, are much more skewed at the five prime end than the other samples. This region here in E, oh, so D would be the output when it was normalized. This region here in E, where it's above the actual and under, under the projected curve, is what they'd use to calculate uh, the degradation index. So that space will, will be used, or I guess the area under the curve here will be used to calculate a degradation index uh, to evaluate the extent to which each gene has been degraded. Um, this was the figure they used to evaluate uh, different metrics. And I was somewhat disappointed because they even talked about QSVA in the abstract in the introduction and, and chose not to use it as a method here. Um, but what we can see here is CV stands for um, coefficient of variation. 
and you're looking at log mean counts. So you would expect as the counts get lower, there's going to be more variation. But the key here is the DEG norm tends to have lower or similar variation in its predictions than the other, than the other samples or the other methods, excuse me. The, the more important one is, is this left hand side here, or I guess right hand, but uh, what they're evaluating here is this ECDF, I think it's, uh, shoot, I forget what it stands for, but it's, uh, it's a false detection, right? It's a predictable, um, empirical um, cumulative distribution function. No? Yes. And what it's meant to do is evaluate um, essentially false detections in your data. Um, and what you hope is that your data falls on the line here. And assuming that it does, that would mean there's, there's few to no false detections or overrepresentation in distributions. Um, and what you can see is in each of these samples, we listed uh, DEG norm was more competitive in most of them, if not all. Um, so some of the conclusions we can draw here are the DEG norm does prov prove to, I guess, provide a better means of residualizing out degradation data. Um, they didn't provide the comparison to QSVA I was looking at. So I was wondering, maybe we should, uh, what, remake this last one, but just with QSVA and DEG norm for, for a subset to compare. Um, especially, I would, I would assume we already have it for the DLPFC data maybe. Um, the concerns, so they, they listed several concerns at the end of the paper. Um, they only included like a total of what, 20 to 30 samples or so in the paper. And they, they made a note that it took nine hours to compute the matrix. Um, and, and that might not be feasible for us because we're always working with hundreds or thousands of samples. And, and so this, this might be an issue. Um, the other issue they brought up, it, it was only tested on the kinds of data um, available in this paper. And uh, it, it was a very limited number of studies and also the, the kind of RNA data was pretty uniform. And so it hasn't really been tested across um, different methods and different protocols for developing RNA data. Uh, they even said in the, in the paper that they don't recommend using this for, so if you have data sets that are merged between two different kinds of, of protocols, um, that this will not perform as well. And I, I think part of that is that it's only probably been tested so far on one kind of, of RNA data. Um, and the other issue is, is it, it overestimates uh, degradation at low coverage. Um, and so that, this is an issue as well. Um, is you, you're probably falling in the boat almost back to where QSBA is, where you're being, you're ending on the conservative end. Um, you, you nor anything that's going to be rare or slight differential expression. Uh, you might end up getting false negatives. And so th this is the other issue. Um, I guess that's the end of my slideshow. Uh, this is the R package and the vignette they made. Um, I thought it was a pretty well done vignette. Um, so as a whole, they have two functions here and you have to read in uh, at least two BAM files and one GTF file. Um, and then this second part down here is going to calculate coverage for, 
for those BAM files listed. I think for the most part, we probably with our RNA data are past this step, right? Like we have, we have counts and coverage already. And so probably for the most part, we would be down here where we're at, we're at the, the DEG norm step. And this is really slow. I try to just run it on the sample data, which is um, only three samples. And it's only like 339 genes. And it's, uh, it's taken an hour and a half so far. So, but this, this calculates the matrix and does, um, does the normalization as well. Um, Let's see. I forget what downsampling means, but I know it's an iterative process. It's almost like clustering, right? And and so you have to choose how many iterations you want, figuring on how how much time you have. Isn't downsampling like a way of like normalizing the reads across different samples? Leo. So normally, um, like this, this is more of a statistics um, um, thing. Downsampling is when they like um, take a subset of the data because um, maybe you don't need all of it to compute the statistics that you have in case that it speeds up your computation speed. Um, um, so, um, uh, so here it looks like, yeah, like, uh, uh, if you say downsampling equals one, which is, I guess is true, because the other option is downsampling equals zero, which I guess is false. It says there that if downsampling is equal one, then it, it beams the read coverage in, in, um, in uh, the default grid size, which is 10 base pairs. So it, like, instead of looking at a single base pair, it, it looks at, at, uh, at a small windows of 10 base pairs at a time. So then you have to compute. God. Uh, a tenth of the data, right? So uh, mm -hmm. this is something that people okay. use when your when your computation method is uh, takes quite a bit of time. And it looks here that they're doing some iteration work, right? Uh, 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 so if you have enough data, if enough reads, maybe that is uh, you know down sampling could be good. Um, okay. Gotcha. Okay. And then, so what this generates, maybe we could do this part live. Um, you get, you get a counts object. with with these categories. So it has your normalized counts and the DI that's that's calculated uh, along with uh, with clustering and and the envelope described. Uh, and then you can output that in into visualizations like this um, where you can see before and after um, how the data was changed. And again, you can get some box plots here of, of the what degradation integrity index. And on this last one, I'm not sure what the Y index is, if that's like a histogram of how many genes fall into each bin. But you can make a heat map of, of the DI and, and cluster the genes accordingly, I, I believe. And then see if, see, this would show if the, the degradation integrity is similar across all your, all your samples. So any questions? <laughs> 